And we welcome everyone to Health for the World International Grand Rounds. We are honored to have our Health for the World International Grand Round speaker today, Dr. Christine Chung. Dr. Christine Chung is professor in residence of, in radiology at UCSD in the musculoskeletal division. She's the vice chair of radiology. She's a clinical translational researcher and the director of UCSD musculoskeletal imaging research group um, located at 3T MR laboratory. She's currently a charter member of SPSR NIH study section. Dr. Chung is a world renowned educator and has been invited to lectures around the world. She has received numerous awards for excellence in teaching, both within her institution as well as at national and international meetings, such as ISMRM. Uh, she has delivered the Steinbeck's lecture at UCSF and has been also invited to deliver the Freiburg lecture at HSS in 2012. Um, Dr. Chung, um, thank you so much for uh, giving the grand rounds for us. And the topic for today is metabolic and endocrine disorders. It's really my pleasure. Thanks for the invitation. Uh, I wanted to just start with this slide, maybe one of the most important of my talk and that leaders lead by example. And I am very honored uh, to be able to work with these leaders in my department, Dr. Alice Chong on the left and Dr. Eddie Smitteman on the right, who founded uh, our San Diego UCSD Health for the World chapter. Uh, they are joined by Dr. Dorothy Tamia Murillo and Anthony Tadros in leading efforts in education and equity, diversity, and inclusion, as well as in wellness. And as we've recognized at UCSD through one of our peer mentoring groups that we've established, RADWELL, um, diversity, education, wellness, they comprise a Venn diagram and all overlap. And so we're we're very, very honored, again, to work with these leaders who <clears throat> help us with all of these initiatives in our department. As we begin our time together today, we're going to discuss metabolic disorders and manifestations in the musculoskeletal system as we approach it from an imaging standpoint. This is a challenging topic because there are so many metabolic disorders we see these manifestations, but yet as we think about images that we're looking at on the PAC station of all different types, we're trying to generate a differential set of considerations. What that means, you make a finding and you're trying to then move to the next level of your evaluation of that finding and try to offer the referring physician some guidance as to what could be causing it. One strategy for that is to think about broad-based categories of disease. Could this be trauma, acute or chronic? Could it be from some carcinoma or malignancy? Could it be from, and don't forget, in that list of differential considerations, metabolic disorders. It's easy to forget about these because often they're not the primary thing in a patient's clinical history, but part of the background. So, <clears throat> As we approach different findings today, in this list of metabolic disorders, we're going to focus on the imaging finding and then the differentials, as though we're sitting at the PAC station and identifying that finding. We're going to start with decreased bone density, and the title of this slide says bone fragility. Now, when we think about decreased bone density, osteopenia, and we look at it on a plain film, often we're saying things like, oh, that film looks washed out. This person may have some decreased bone density. Well, we want to be a little bit more specific and objective if we can, and we want to identify the contributions of that decreased density. Well, we think about it being cortical bone. As you look at this lateral view of the elbow, the cortex, that thicker white line. But as you think about all the contributions to bone density, looking inside the bone at their trabecular pattern, while it's thin and very delicate, imagine this in every bone of your body. And if you add all that up, it makes a very significant contribution to the overall density and the strength. Kind of like thinking about a honeycomb, all of 
of those very delicate little components really adding to the overall strength. So these two images should really be imprinted in your mind when you're thinking about trabecular bone and how much it can change in states of decreased bone density. So little trabeculae on the right, a robust network on the left, and imagine how much weaker this bone may be on the right compared to the left. As we think about bone fragility, there are a few different things that are reflected with regard to cause. Increased bone turnover, an abnormal remodeling rate, or a mineralization defect or abnormal collagen. Well, if I make those two things very simple, one is a decreased quantity of bone, as shown in those two images of the trabeculae. The second two would refer to decreased quality of bone. And that when we think about things like mineralization defects or problems with the overall quality, in this case, an insufficiency fracture, failure of bone in the setting of abnormal quality. In this case, the bone just doesn't break, it sort of bends and you see these micro fractures as lucency with surrounding sclerosis as those micro fractures try to heal themselves over time. The force hasn't been enough to actually break the bone through and through transected through a fracture line. Well, I suggested that we would like to have objective ways to evaluate the finding of decreased bone density. As you look at this radiograph through the proximal femur, we unmask the underlying trabecular pattern. That's sort of like thinking about having housing a house with siding. You take the siding off of it and then you see the framework of the house. Well, that happens with our bones. As we lose the density from that thick outer cortex in through projection imaging methods like X-ray or even DEXA, then we start to unmask the trabecular pattern. The framework of this bone would be to have compressive trabeculae and tensile trabeculae, the compressive coming down the medial aspect of the femur, the tensile arcing across the head neck junction, centrally an area that has less trabeculae and that's called Ward's triangle. So when we unmask this trabecular pattern and see very well compressive tensile trabeculae as well as Ward's triangle, it's an objective finding that we've decreased bone density in that femur. Now, there are different findings in different parts of the body that lead to that. As you look at the hand, the second metacarpal index, we look at the long axis here in the frontal radiograph, we measure, just guesstimate or estimate it, the width of the cortex medially and laterally. And if you were to add that width up, place it in the and have space left over, it would suggest that you've got decreased density in the hand. As you look at this frontal radiograph of the knee, contrast here within the vascular system, you can identify these areas of delicate linear sclerosis perpendicular to the long axis of the bone. Those are called reinforcement lines and have been implicated in decreased bone density. This frontal radiograph of the knee shows a permeative pattern. That's to say when you're looking at the distal femur, the tibia, the fibula, you see these little tiny areas of lucency that look like little polka dots all over the place. That's cortical tunneling, in this case, in every one of the bones you're seeing on the radiograph. We have to be careful because this permeative pattern when it's very focal and geographic can be associated with some malignancies or aggressive bone lesions. When we see it diffusely, it's suggestive of the cortical tunneling associated with decreased mineralization. In the vertebral bodies here, we've unmasked the trabecular pattern in the vertebral body, these vertical trabeculae perpendicular to the end plate. The second finding in the vertebral bodies with regard to decreased mineralization, the end plates start to look very well defined, almost sclerotic as though, as some, as though someone took a sharp pencil and outlined those areas. 
So as we think about differential consideration for diffuse mm. osteopenia, that means osteopenia that we're going to encounter across the body, here's a, a set of differential considerations. Osteoporosis, osteomalacia, hyperparathyroidism. I've underlined those because in those cases, we'll look at secondary findings that help you take that initial finding of decreased mineralization and then say, well, which of these things could it be? Is there something specific in the imaging that helps point me towards one of these broad-based things in my differential? The osteogenesis imperfecta and multiple myeloma we won't talk about today. And generally, you'll have some history of that in the clinical history of the patient. So as you look at these three images in the center, you've got a patient whose soft tissue density of the vascular system, here the aorta, almost more dense than the bones. We don't have enough detail to really be able to unmask trabecular pattern, but you can see that secondary finding of an end plate that looks very dense. Again, almost as though somebody put put a sharp pencil line across it. We see a secondary finding that shows that the spine had fragility or decreased strength of bone in the presence of a compression fracture, decreased height anteriorly as compared to posteriorly. This, an example of senile osteoporosis. Now, as you compare and contrast the lumbar spine with the lateral image on the right, we don't see that nice, very linear, dense sclerosis at the end plate. We don't really see a classic compression or wedge deformity, but in this case, the concave end plates that reflect the remodeling of the decreased density, in this case, opposite to the idea of having that linear sclerotic end plate. Here it almost looks like somebody took the eraser of that pencil and smudged the end plate. That very characteristic of osteomalacia. Think about this as soft bone that remodels easily over time. The image on the left, a lateral view through the calcaneus, a classic finding associated with secondary hyperparathyroidism, and that's osseous resorption. In this case, at the emphasis or soft tissue attachment side of the plantar fascia. Again, looking like somebody took the eraser of a pencil and smudged the bone where that soft tissue attachment occurred. As we think about senile osteoporosis, there are several facts that go along with it. There is an abnormal remodeling rate of bone. It's resorbed at a greater rate than it's formed. The quality of this bone, were we to take a biopsy, would likely be normal, just not enough of it. When we think about that, the idea, if we took a histologic preparation of bone, we would have cortical thinning. You saw trabecular paucity in the example I showed you before, but the cortex becomes thinner. We may see enlargement of perversion canals with cortical tunneling, and this would result in bone that is less strong. As we think about predisposing factors, female gender, age, postmenopausal, low weight, the muscle pulling on the bone helps to maintain its density, loading the bone through walking, that also uh, helps to maintain its density. Family history, race are all factors that have been associated with decreased bone density. As we look at the findings that we commonly encounter, they're really the results of decreased strength of bone falling on your outstretched hand, having these compression fractures, hip fractures. One thing to realize when you're dealing with decreased bone density, bone that is less strong, the trauma that is required to have the bone fail in these ways is much less. So it may not be a traumatic fall where um, it, it seems very aggressive. It could be, a, you know, I leaned over to get something and pressed down a bit harder than usual, and then it really hurt, or I stepped off the curb. So the history, again, um, will not possibly reflect something that um, really shows in the severity of the imaging finding that you encounter. So keep that in mind. That's kind of a little tip that you're dealing with somebody with decreased bone density in these cases.
Vertebral involvement is associated with a high frequency of femoral fracture. So remember, if you see something in the vertebral body, take a look at the femur and vice versa. While we relate this with a postmenopausal process and hormonal influences, it's pretty clear that the picture is more complex than that. And a fact that supports this is that 50% of postmenopausal fractures don't occur in the setting of osteoporosis. And this confirms really that bone density is not the only determinant of bone strength. So, so there's still work to be done with regard to uh, this issue in, in our population. I'm sure most of you are familiar with the concept of DEXA, and DEXA is a broadly utilized tool to help us to be able to diagnose and quantify the degree of decreased bone density. Just a few facts about DEXA. This imaging method has really evolved over the past several years. So again, one of the big benefits is that we're able to have a quantification method. It's broadly standardized. And while it isn't the most detailed understanding of cortex versus trabecular involvement, it does give us a reliable way to be able to diagnose and follow the process of decreased density across our population, and it's very cost effective. With regard to its evolution over time, and it, it has also developed tools to help us predict whether or not patients will have complications of fracture. Just for your knowledge, that's called the FRAX tool or Fracture Risk Assessment Tool. Another very valuable tool that the DEXA allows us is to have an understanding of the patient's BMI and the contents and components because we realize that loading the skeleton, having lean muscle mass to be able to pull on the bones is an important part of its overall strength. So this is another very important aspect that, be, that we're able to interrogate through DEXA. So we're going to complete our discussion here of bone density, at least systemic bone density, through this focus session. Here's a frontal radiograph of the, of the pelvis in an 84-year-old woman with bilateral hip pain. Well, if I hadn't told you that this woman was 84, you may not have suspected it because Look at her hips, not too much degenerative change. The overall bone mineral density as assessed by looking for unmasking of her trabecular pattern really doesn't look very significant. She's clearly had surgery, a posterior decompression in her lumbar spine. But as you look at the findings here in her bilateral proximal femora, you see that there's this remodeling of the cortical surface as well as the endosteum on both sides. Now remember, compressive cortex and then the tensile side of the bone arcing across to the lateral margin. When you think about stress injuries, usually we encounter them on the compressive side because as you think about the vector of loading the pelvis, that vector of force, your torso and your upper body, the vector comes straight down. So of course, as you think about the distribution of force in weight bearing, it's going to be most efficiently dealt with by these compressive trabeculae. But the body constructed in a, in a very clever way, these tensile trabeculae help to dissipate the force coming down the compressive side to the lateral cortex. And also think about the big muscle groups about the pelvis pulling when you contract them to also lessen that force that is, uh, that is encountered by those compressive trabeculae. So in and of itself, the mechanics of how the pelvis and musculature are structured is really fascinating. As you look at this finding, this has been referred to as an atypical femoral fracture. So here is, again, one of these disconnects. As you look at this bone, it looks dense. It looks like there's enough of it, but you're going to see this as a recurring theme. Because the bone is dense, it does not necessarily mean that it has the same strength. In osteomalacia, we can have smudgy increased density, but we know that that's softer bone and not as strong. 
here what we found with regards to the bone that is amplified through bisphosphonate therapies, it's more dense, but it is not as strong. And over time, repeatedly loading the skeleton, we start to have failure in the bone through these atypical fractures. We see endosteal remodeling, periosteal remodeling, and we see lucency. So again, micro fractures that occur, attempts to heal them, and then at some point in time, these can clearly complete and fracture completely across the bone. They look like this. So problematic is exactly this type of atypical femoral fracture. This is the film that you may see, and the history may be something very benign and very broad trauma. So you may think, gosh, a femur fracture, they must have gotten hit by the car. But if you would look into the electronic medical record or talk to the referring physician or patient, they may some, say something like, oh, I stepped off a curb, very minor trauma resulting in this very significant injury. In this case, if you look really closely at the margin of the fracture in the lateral side, you see that bit of heaped up and remodeled cortex. That really is the clue. In many cases, you're not going to notice that just because you're looking at the fracture and it's hard then to imagine what this bone looked like intact. Important fact about these atypical femoral fractures, they can be located a significant distance distal to that lesser trochanter. So as you look at the earlier findings with endosteal or periosteal remodeling, and a patient presents and says, I have hip pain, often the patient may not be great at localizing exactly where in the leg or even in the pelvis hip pain in their mind corresponds to, you may miss these early findings. So if they're on bisphosphonate therapies and presenting with any sort of discomfort, surveying the more distal femur would be important. As you look at the overall morphology of the fracture, this very classic based on the fact that the initial abnormalities and remodeling occur at the tensile side. So this medial beak with varus angulation is a classic morphology of the fracture. This periosteal and endosteal remodeling has been referred to as the skirt of focal buttressing. And as we look closer, we can see that very nicely here and on the opposite side as well. As we look at MR imaging findings, in many cases, we see that there's altered high signal intensity on the endosteum, raising the possibility that this finding may occur at the endosteum first and then involve the cortex and periosteal margin. Just be aware of that. And it can be very, very subtle on both the plane film. Here, the nuclear medicine scan really lighting up in that region. The MR, again, very subtle. Look at the cross section here, the axial image through this region of the femoral diaphysis. The clue here, the endosteal high signal intensity, this dot is a nutrient from Raymond or vessel crossing the cortex. We don't even see periosteal high signal intensity, linear high signal intensity that would look like this at the periosteal margin to suggest parastitis in this case. So the findings can be very, very subtle. The take home points here, there's a high association of bilateral involvement with limited symptoms that a subset of the fractures occur well below the lesser trochanter, and we have to be careful when looking at MR because the end osteal findings can occur without a lot of cortical or periosteal involvement. We're going to move to the next thing, osteomalacia, on our differential considerations for finding decreased bone density. Again, we're going to emphasize the idea that as you look at these two images, you see concave endplates in both. The difference on the right side, again, that very accentuated end plate and on the left, that really smudged appearance, again, as though somebody took an eraser and smudged the margin of the bone in this case. 
having a smudgy appearance, a chalky appearance to the bone are classic findings that people who read a lot of plain films historically may describe osteomalacic bone as. So we realize that this is a defect in mineralization that's due to the vitamin D axis. And when we consider that vitamin D axis, we realize that sunlight is involved. The liver, the kidney, the intestine. This is a complex process, vitamin D metabolism, and things can go wrong in various places along that axis. As we're considering the secondary findings here of osteomalacia, besides decreased mineralization, perhaps in this view of the left hip, we may start to have, again, this idea of smudgy trabeculate, not very well defined. This isn't related to motion in this case. It really is a finding. And I have to say it's a subtle finding. So after you look at hundreds and thousands of plain films, these subtle findings will start to catch your eye. In this case, you've got the secondary finding of these insufficiency type fractures. The microfracture of the lucency with surrounding heaped up sclerosis failure occurring here on both the tensile as well as the compressive side. The bone isn't just breaking, it's bending. Another classic location, lateral margin of the scapula. Here the lucency heaped up sclerosis. So as things have these micro fractures from this either repetitive trauma or minor trauma, the body starts to try to heal it. You saw this example already in the proximal ulna. So the insufficiency fractures, the incomplete fractures of the looser zones, very characteristic of abnormal quality of bone. So we can have that abnormal quality in adults. We would refer to it as osteomalacia and in skeletally immature patients where we would refer to that as rickets. The classic finding in rickets really is irregularity at the physis or the growth plate. Again, when you look at this frontal radiograph, clearly soft tissue changes with swelling and prominence but look at the margin of the growth plate or physis here. Again, similar to the adult, looks like somebody took a pencil eraser and smudged that physis. When you look at the T1 and the fluid sensitive sequences here, I think it's actually a little easier to appreciate on the T1 because the margin of the physis on both sides should be nice and linear and low signal intensity and well-defined. In this case, again, it looks like somebody smudged the margin of it. So on the gradient sequence here, it's a little harder to appreciate that. You can see the widening, but widening, I think, is again, if you're not used to looking at a lot of pediatric images, unless you have something to correlate with um, as a reference normal standard, it, it can just be challenging. It just is. So the plain film a bit easier, but really keep your eye on the physio margin on the MR images. And when you're looking at MR for the trainees, think about what would that look like on a plain film and be able to make that transition. That's super helpful when you're thinking about um, imaging differential considerations, and especially if you don't have the plain film available to you at the time you're looking at the MR. So as you look at here, again, approaching this as the differential for metaphyseal irregularity. So if I called you on the phone and I said, listen, here's the finding. It's a skeletally immature patient and they've got metaphyseal irregularity. You would want to ask me, describe it in greater detail, be more granular. If I had to draw a picture from what you were telling me on the phone, how would I draw it? So in the case of rickets, you might say, well, draw the metaphysis, make it a little wider than usual, take your eraser and smudge the margin that smudgy appearance, that would be the key that the metaphyseal irregularity in that case was from rickets. Hypophosphatasia, what you might say to the person is, well, draw the metaphysis and maybe make it slightly wider, but then take little areas out of the metaphysis as though you were taking a spoon and scooping out or an ice cream scooper and scooping out little geographic areas. That's the key. This scooped out or 
loss of geographic components along the physis. And then for things like Schmidt dysplasia, metaphyseal chondral dysplasia, those are the same thing. Make the metaphysis wider. Make the margin slightly irregular, but it doesn't look smudged. It's still well-defined and sclerotic in appearance. Well, I would then think about something like this dysplasia. A caveat to that, what if we took the rickets or perhaps even the hypophosphatasia, less here because there's so much geographic loss, but took the rickets and we treated it. And over time, this was wide healed and sclerotic. This might also look like a Schmidt dysplasia. So a, a, an inactive or healed phase of rickets could also look like that Schmidt dysplasia. So we're emphasizing again the idea here that you generate a differential set of considerations by the finding, in this case, metaphyseal irregularity. You hone down to a specific diagnosis because you start to characterize that finding or look for secondary findings that help you. Okay, so this is really an exercise. It's an iterative exercise. You're going to be doing this every day when you look at images at the PACS. So it's really a, a good way to approach looking at images. How about this metaphyseal irregularity seen bilaterally here? Bone density looks great. Not a lot of diffuse soft tissue swelling. The carpus is completely normal. When you look at the physis, it's widened. The margin looks sclerotic. It's bilateral, really characteristic of somebody who is repeatedly traumatizing these upper extremities, which gymnasts do because they treat their upper extremities like lower extremities. They're loading them through vaulting, walking on their hands. So it's a repetitive trauma. The little leaguer shoulder, so little leaguers, baseball players, uh, perhaps cricket players, if you're in the UK or a place uh, that, that has cricket as one of their primary sports, you can see on the MR, again, I think it's a little easier to see it on the non-fat suppressed and the fat suppressed. Look, the physis should have nice low signal, pretty linear, and it shouldn't be very wide. As you look at the lateral margin, you see the widening, and again, the effacement of the linear component of the physis. Repetitive microtrauma, the throwing shoulder over and over again. Good news, you take away the insult of the repetitive trauma, and that irregularity goes away and the physis heals. So a very distinct departure, the radiographic uh, appearance of the irregularity and repetitive microtrauma from the metabolic disorder of rickets. The same words basically used to characterize the finding or to describe the basic finding, but as you really hone in on the characterization, it changes. Well, moving to hyperparathyroidism now. Here you're seeing the parathyroid hormone axis. Uh, the primary uh, defect occurring with regard to adenomas. If we think about primary versus secondary hyperparathyroidism, there are a whole list of findings we might encounter on plain films. And you can see that in either the primary or secondary, any of these findings can occur. However, in some cases, they become rare in one versus the other. So the osteosclerosis is fairly rare in primary hyperparathyroidism. The chondrocalcinosis is fairly rare in secondary hyperparathyroidism. So that's something to keep in the back of your mind. As we think about hyperparathyroidism, I showed you an example already of, of um, bone resorption at soft tissue attachment sites. We can also see osseous resorption at places like the intervertebral discs. You see the remodeling of the end plates with Schmorl's nerd formation. We can see resorption of the subchondral bone here occurring in the medial compartment of the knee. The target here, the subchondral bone, you see as that's resorbed. In this case, you got altered marrow signal intensity in the condyle and the cartilage that has nothing to attach to. It's just floating here through a broad delamination in that distal femur. This example you saw already with resorption at soft tissue attachment sites. Remember the soft tissue attachment is called the emphasis. Here the plantar fascia at the inferior margin of the calcaneus.
classic subperiosteal resorption shown here. As you look at this frontal radiograph of the hand, you can see that resorption occurring along primarily the radial aspects, affecting most prominently the second and third rays, middle phalanx, proximal phalanx. And then as we start to be detectives and sleuths, we can see here another finding acroosteolysis. This is called the central or band type form. Distal acroosteolysis means that the distal margin of the tuft is resorbed in the central or band as it name implies it's the central portion of the tuft with a little bit of residual tuft remaining that central or band like very characteristic of primary hyperparathyroidism so that in conjunction with the osseous resorption helps you make a very specific diagnosis so again you're starting with something broad with a finding you're looking closer finding other things that help you be more precise in your differential considerations. With regard to the chondrocalcinosis, you've probably all seen this on radiographs. It looks like very delicate little dots or lines. That chondrocartilage calcinosis calcification occurring in these cases in hyaline articular cartilage as well as fibrocartilage in the meniscus of the knee, fibrocartilage in the triangular fibrocartilage in the wrist. The clue in this case is the diffuse calcification in the absence of degenerative change. The age of this patient younger than we would expect for chondrocalcinosis related to aging, no degenerative taint change to suggest the rheumatologic disorder. So you're thinking about primary hyperparathyroidism. Now, as hyperparathyroid comes into play, not only looking at bone density, but secondary findings. Remember, for lucent lesions or lytic lesions, metabolic disorder should be in your differential consideration because clearly the brown tumor can occur in the setting of primary hyperparathyroidism. Secondary hyperparathyroidism having the osteosclerosis of the rugger jersey spine, the band-like sclerosis that moves across the vertebra. We'll move through the differential considerations of regional or geographic decreased mineralization. You have a fracture, you don't bear weight, and then you lose density. We know we have to load the bone in order to maintain our density. Look at the cortical tunneling, all of the little holes in the bone. We know that we can have a complex regional pain syndrome previously referred to as reflex sympathetic dystrophy, pseudex atrophy, causalgia, appears to be mediated by the sympathetic nervous system. The radiographic findings are to have periarticular loss of bone density. In the vast majority of cases that we encounter clinically, usually there's soft tissue swelling. There can be an atrophic form that does not have the soft tissue swelling. Patients often don't remember the traumatic episode as it can occur several months prior to the presentation of this complex regional pain syndrome on nuclear medicine studies uptake in the periarticular region where you encounter the decreased mineralization. The transient regional decreased mineralization can occur focally or it can occur, resolve, and then move to another location. When we identify this prior to the plain film finding of decreased mineralization and see it on MRI, the manifestation is transient painful marrow edema. Patients presenting with a painful limb, often the hip or lower extremity, and what we encounter is the altered marrow signal intensity. As we think about nuclear medicine findings, again, increased uptake. Historically, the patient population that presented was women in their third trimester of pregnancy, but as this entity became reported more broadly, the more common patient population was young middle-aged men.
you're looking for altered signal intensity within the proximal femur. Other locations, again, in the lower extremity can have this uh, finding occur or entity involved. In the femur, often the altered marrow signal intensity extends from the subchondral bone plate to the intertrochanteric region, a classic component of transient painful marrow edema. <clears throat> excuse me, is the sparing of the inframedial margin of the femur. Conservative therapy with, in some cases, some limited activity to prevent collapse, subchondral collapse of the bone, and that marrow altered signal intensity completely resolves. Here, a similar finding as you look at the altered marrow signal intensity, geographic in nature, extending to the intertrochanteric line, sparing of the inframedial femur, the altered high signal intensity and fluid sensitive sequences, these patients often have joint diffusion. When you see this finding, you are looking for any subtle subchondral linear abnormality that could suggest the presence of an insufficiency fracture. We want to be careful that this is not present. If it is, we have to consider again, altering the weight bearing status of the patient to be sure that they don't end up collapsing the bone. As I explained, these can occur in one place, resolve, and then occur at another location. Here's an example, a 30-year-old, not yet with decreased bone density by our objective criteria of unmasking the trabecular pattern, we see that same finding of altered mirror signal intensity. Eight months later, he presented with pain in the opposite side. Again, no decreased mineralization or density. However, we see that the findings resolved on the left side and then occurred on the right side, making this a migratory process in this patient, which also resolved on the right side. So realizing that that can occur in your patient population is important. Obviously, rheumatologic disorders, especially the resorptive ones like rheumatoid arthritis, can present with decreased bone density here, a classic location in the wrist, proximal, often bilateral and symmetric. The finding here helping you with the diagnosis of rheumatoid arthritis, the classic finding of ulnar translocation of the carpus. The inflammatory process affects static stabilizing structures and the whole carpus shifts to the ulnar side. You can see that because the scaphoid should articulate with the scaphoid fossa of the radius, the lunate with the lunate fossa, and you can see everything is shifted towards the ulnar side. Osseous resorption as well as decreased bone density, very characteristic of rheumatoid arthritis. Moving now to the next disorder or process, Paget's disease, classic findings here. And now, rather than having an accentuation of the trabecular pattern because the bone density is decreased and we unmask it, we're laying down bone. This bone is not stronger. This bone is soft, though it's dense, and can remodel very easily. So classic, the trabecular pattern accentuated here, the bone enlarged in both the proximal femur and hemipelvis, as well as the vertebral body. The distinction here to be made on the left, the unmasking from decreased bone density on the right, accentuation because we're laying down abnormal osteoid. So really keep that in mind when you're considering the accentuation of the trabecular pattern. Paget's disease, the epidemiology occurring in Caucasian men over the age of 50, painful in about a quarter of the patients, and has three phases that are discussed, a lytic phase, a mixed lytic sclerotic phase, and a sclerotic phase proper. So we can see a variable appearance with regard to pagetoid bone. As you look at the MR, remember what I said before, think about what it would look like on a plain film. In this case, the vascularity increased in the distribution of the trabecular pattern. This is the MR correlate of trabecular accentuation seen in early Paget's disease. You see it's also involving uh, the pelvis as well. 
we see again this accentuated trabecular pattern here in the glenoid, the intense uptake on the nuclear medicine study by talking to yourself in some cases, what is the finding, trabecular coarsening. Also on the MR, intense uptake, you're gonna make them by saying to yourself out loud or identifying what those findings are, you're then able to make a diagnosis. In trabecular coarsening, you're gonna be thinking about obviously the metabolic disorder of Paget disease. A much more subtle case here, look at the plain film, the coarsening of the trabecular pattern deep to the anterior cortex of the femur that is shown on the MR images as well. That finding consistent with early Paget disease in this case. Thyroid disorders, as we think about these hyperthyroidism and thyroid acropaki, not a huge number of patients who present with these things, but they are very characteristic, the findings. Now, what is the finding in thyroid acropaki? It is periosteal reaction, but it's periosteal reaction that has characteristic findings, very robust, shaggy in its appearance in a classic location. Radial side of the first, second classically raised, both proximally in the hands and distally in the feet. Another example here in the feet, shaggy periosteal reaction, predominating on the medial sides of those metatarsals. Classic appearance, classic distribution. And so when you've seen that classic appearance, when you look at this very subtle one, what's the finding? Well, the finding is periosteal reaction. Subtle, but present. You see the bone elevated. Associated soft tissue swelling. Look at the MR. Well, imagine what this would look like if it were bone. Shaggy periosteal reaction, soft tissue prominence. By thinking about what that MR appearance in the soft tissue looks like if it were ossified, you easily make the diagnosis because the findings are then very classic to you. So now let's think about what periosteal reaction looks like in different forms and different entities. Again, if I were talking to you on the bone and said there's periosteal reaction in the tibia, you want me to be more specific. Smooth, bilateral, symmetric. This is the distal femur, by the way. Uh, not the tibia, but this type of periosteal reaction can also occur in the tibia. Very characteristic of hypertrophic pulmonary osteoarthropathy. There's periosteal reaction in the distal tibia and fibula. Be more specific. Shaggy periosteal reaction that bridges the syndesmosis. Now I'm going to be thinking about pachyderma peristosis or venous stasis. Perhaps I say to you, there's periosteal reaction again in the distal tibia. You would say to me, be more specific, please. It's at a focal bony prominence, the medial malleolus. Now in this case, the second thing you may want to know, what do the overlying soft tissues look like? Are they intact? Because if we're going to think about infection in our differential of inflammation, we like that in adults to come from the outside in. Clearly, this kind of focal inflammation, if it's mature periosteal reaction, could have a more benign cause, and that might be a friction syndrome with a soft tissue structure rubbing against that bony prominence. So again, you make the finding. You've got a differential set of considerations, and you reason through other findings to help you be more precise. In our set of differential considerations and findings in the musculoskeletal system, osteosclerosis, a long laundry list here, among them some metabolic disorders. And we've seen osteosclerosis occur in some of the metabolic disorders that we have discussed today. But just to be precise on a few of them, mastocytosis can be sclerotic or mixolytic sclerotic, diffuse sclerosis in the skeleton, sometimes with a little salt and pepper appearance, could be characteristic of mastocytosis. Osteopoikolosis, you've probably all seen at least an example in a book, multiple bone islands, again, a kind of a polka dot, but in this case, the dots are dense well defined and they cascade across the bone, a very classic appearance here. Up close and personal, you can see again that polka dotted appearance. Pycnodysostosis, diffuse osteosclerosis. Well, what's the secondary finding in this case that in the setting of these very dense bones help you make this diagnosis? 
the distal acroosteolysis. So as we consider metabolic disorders, disorders of all types, we're making findings, we're including them in differential sets of consideration, we're being observant, we're looking at other imaging findings, we're drawing in clinical history to help us be more precise in our ultimate description. Drug-induced bone disorders, several disorders result from various different types of exposures to chemicals, drugs, etc. Steroids, alcohol, heparin, dilantin, fluorosis, all these different things with lists of potential findings that we could find. Of course, these become kind of a metabolic or a systemic process based on the exposures in general. So over the course of our time together, 50 minutes or so, we've had an approach of looking at findings and differential considerations to remember that these metabolic disorders can present with findings similar to things that we'll encounter all over the body. A reminder in how we're gonna approach these things when we're sitting at the PACs and think about them globally. So I hope that this has been helpful and useful to you both in the information from a radiographic standpoint, but as well in how you're going to approach thinking about keeping an open mind about what you see when you're looking at images on the PACs. So the broad-based category of disease approach emphasizing differential considerations is something that I still use today after 20 years of being in radiology to help me uh, really best serve my patient population. Thank you so much for your time. And I want to again reiterate my thanks to Dr. Smitteman and Chong and uh, again reiterate what an honor it is to work with the both of them in this setting and in my own department. Thank you, Christine, for this uh, for that lovely talk. Um, and uh, this is sorry, this is Eddie uh, Smitterman. Um, yeah. Hi, um, thanks, thanks hi, again Eddie. so much thanks for doing this. Hi, hi, Bavia. Hi. Um, so, so uh, just one question from the from the panel uh, from Dr. Shaw, uh, uh, Dr. Shaw, if you will. Uh, are you aware of any uh, uh, studies that look at periosteal reaction per se for uh, under ultrasound, perhaps? Oh. Um, that perhaps help for things like thyroid acropaki? Well, I'm so glad that Dr. Smineman is on the call because he is the <laughs> ultrasound expert, not I. So I'm, I'm going to ask for your help on that one. Uh, well, I, well, Dr. Shaw's asked. So uh, um, I, I'm personally not and not aware, um, but uh, uh, you can, you know, we ultrasound obviously can be used for to evaluate for fractures and, and periosteal hematoma. And uh, stripping, Dr. Shaw, uh, uh, especially in where it's at le less adherent within uh, with kids, um, and uh, there are case reports out there that that uh, do describe that, but I don't know a large study per se looking at uh, periosteitis uh, evaluation by ultrasound. Um, but yeah, that being said, I I, I would probably favor um, looking at uh, MR uh, earlier on, just just because it would uh, provide a, a larger view of of the area of concern it's rather than trying to evaluate multiple uh, a large area of bone or multiple bone but yeah but yeah and thank you so much again christine that, that, that was a, a a beautiful talk um a nice a great overview on uh, metabolic diseases uh, a really difficult topic thanks eddie always a pleasure Thanks, Christine, and thanks, Eddie, for helping us here. Uh, I will just kind of uh, open the Q&A just to see if there's anything else. Uh, Somebody if... asked about, does his, oh, um, mm -hmm. in our daily practice, we meet cases of osteopenia and osteomalacia and illustrate differential um, recommendations. So, so it's complex, obviously, trying to figure out which it is. So they're asking, does histology of, of bone help? Um, can you encourage or recommend it? Does it mean that a bone biopsy has to be taken? So that's a super interesting question. Um, I think um, prior to the bone biopsy, clearly the hormonal workup that this person um, suggests is preferable to the patients. For early findings of osteomalacia, we have um, one of our uh, renal docs, especially at the VA, who's been really interested in this, and we're trying to find some MR biomarkers to be able to look at 
in places they would do a bone marrow biopsy, biomarkers that might help us to tell the difference between um, the marrow activity with decreased just mineralization from penia versus malacia. And so stay posted because hopefully we'll have some answers on that from a non-invasive assessment. But I would say first the hormonal workup, but yes, then definitely um, people move to bone biopsy. And I think Eddie does a fair number of those in our practice as well from the interventional standpoint. Thanks so much, Christine. Uh, in the chat box, I think there are just one or two more questions. One is from Dr. Sabar Patel in Kenya. Uh, thanks for your wonderful talk. How do you differentiate between juvenile idiopathic osteoporosis and other juvenile osteoporosis and osteogenesis imperfecta? Um, tough questions. So generally the imaging findings aren't super distinct in those cases. We move to our pediatric colleagues to try to go through the history and then try to understand. With the juvenile idiopathic arthritis, sometimes we're dealing with a more gracile portion of the bone. So we try to kind of pull everything together from that standpoint in addition to um, findings from our referring physician with regard to their history and presentation. Okay, excellent. And uh, uh, from Dr. Shaw, can we use ultrasound and elastography to study growth plates in children? Now, elastography is kind of an interesting idea. I don't know of any studies that have, have used elastography from that standpoint. Eddie, do you for, for growth plate eval? Yeah, I don't, unfortunately, I don't cover much uh, PEDS, um, uh, you know, radiology here at, uh, at the university, um, but, and I'm not aware of any uh, elastography studies to evaluate the, the uh, growth plates? Uh, to the best of my knowledge, elastography so far in the musculoskeletal system has been used primarily for looking at muscle compliance. And then there have been some studies using elastography also to correlate for material property and tendon. But I have not um, read of or know anything about uh, application in the growth plate. We are lucky. We have two MSK leading leading MSK, MSK radiologists here to answer questions. <laughs> okay, and then uh, so a question from Dr. Patricia Rodriguez from Mexico: When DEXA is not available, what place does the quantitative CT have in the assessment of osteoporosis? So the QCT. So there's quantitative CT. So there are a few different things. There's opportunistic CT that's now taking place, and there are I think there is one university right now that is undergoing um, a big study, um, a formal study with an industry um, partner that's trying to just take all of their, there have been several reports in the literature of individual academic locations, but there is a big partnership with an, an entrepreneurial industry um, partner that's trying to take um, CTs that are performed for any um, abdomen, pelvis, lumbar, spine, and then provide a reading of the bone density. So the CT literature, I think, looks really promising from the standpoint of even being more specific um, than DEXA and offering more information. The issue here is, is going to be to standardize it because pretty clearly the major thing, the advantage of DEXA besides low cost is that it's standardized and generally we know what the values mean. So from CT, I think there's tremendous potential. There's starting to be a movement towards standardizing it from the standpoint of opportunistic, meaning you're getting a CT for something else and this is information that should ju just be get gotten for free and reported with it. There's also peripheral QCT, quantitative CT, not so many of those around, but clearly um, they're meant for extremities. They give great information. And you can imagine the CT is giving you super detailed information because it's actually looking at the cortex and the trabecular pattern. So it's more detailed even than the DEXA, but standardization and availability um, again, the radiation, though for CT and P, peripheral QCT, very, very low doses, not quite as low as DEXA, but very low. So all those are considerations. And I would look to, again, opportunistic CT. We should demand really for all our patients that that's just given to us as additional information to help patient care. That's, ex that's excellent. And uh, uh, Dr. Smithman, do you see any other questions? I think we are caught up with the questions, you know? I think so. 
Yeah. So again, we have a lot of thank yous from different parts of the world, and um, just I just name a few. So thank you so much, you know, um, Christine, for doing this for us. Uh, we really appreciate this, and my pleasure. And you know, and Eddie, just for for arranging this. This is this is this has been just excellent. Um, so we have Dr. Rangel from Brazil. Uh, Dr. Arjuna from Sri Lanka. I'm just going to say some names who wanted to introduce themselves. Dr. Alam from Brazil, uh, Dr. Lambert from Zambia, um, Dr. Alberta from Mexico, Dr. Rose from Kenya, Dr. Kleenam Zafiteti from Ghana. She is the chair of radiology in Kolopo Teaching Hospital in Ghana. Dr. Len Gordon from Sierra Leone, um, Dr. Uh, uh, Diodone from Rwanda, Dr. Kristen Dahe from Argentina, Dr. Amit Sahu from New Delhi, India. He said he's also he was also a visiting fellow in UCSD in 2017. And so uh, he says hello. And Dr. Jane Kondo from Bolivia, from South Africa. And I think there's a huge list. Let me just skip down. And everybody's saying thank you uh, and congratulations uh, for for such a wonderful grand rounds. So um, we really <laughs> we really appreciate this, Christine. And uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Smitterman, for you know helping with the moderation and also coming after your meeting for the grand rounds and arranging this, uh, especially for the UCSD Health of the World chapter. All right, thank you so much, everyone. Thanks, everyone, for joining. And thanks for signing uh, in, everybody. It was really a pleasure, completely my pleasure. Thank you, Dr. Christine Chang, for doing this. This was excellent. Thank you, everyone. Have a good day. Bye. 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 Bye.